French Riviera. But rather than bullets, this time the terrorists used the grill of a 20-foot truck to turn a promenade into a slaughterhouse, killing 84 people and injuring dozens more as he plowed through and over the crowds who had gathered to watch the fireworks for Bastille Day in Nice. I'm beginning to wonder if we should just set the candles back up that we had placed on the Lord's table for the victims of the Orlando shooting and just leave them up indefinitely. It seems less a question of if than what. What act of carnage will we have to mourn next Sunday? It's been an agonizing stretch of global history these past few months. And in times like these, it's natural for us to seek comfort and grounding and protection, something that we can latch on to, to help us regain our bearings and feel safe. Sometimes that search can be brash, like choosing to leave the European Union or backing someone like Donald Trump for president. Other times, that searching can be rather mundane. We seek a sense of normalcy by seeking the routine. We keep ourselves busy in order to keep our minds focused elsewhere. So we devote ourselves ardently to our many tasks, as many tasks as we can find. And as people of faith, it's appropriate that we would turn to church for help in times like these, in finding our footing. After all, Jesus is the rock of our salvation. Christ is our good shepherd. We trust him to see us through. And well, we should. Because that is the promise that Jesus has made to us. Lo, I am with you, even until the end of the age. No matter what the ages may bring. Lo, I am with you. But because he is Jesus, we should also come to expect that he will see us through in ways that we don't expect. It may come as a surprise, perhaps even a disappointment to you, that the primary scripture passages before us this morning offer very little in the way of direct comfort, at least not comfort that we would readily recognize. There is neither overt reassurance in the midst of this bewildering life to be found among these verses, nor is there a summons to leave it all behind and come away with Jesus to some far-flung paradise. Amos 8 starts out promising enough. I mean, the prophet looks and he sees this vision of this succulent basket of summer fruit And images of abundant harvests and verdant landscapes are typically symbols of God's favor in the Old Testament, signs of God's promise of rescue, redemption, and renewal coming to pass for God's people. But not so here. This basket turns out to be a mark of shame, a gathering not of a bountiful harvest but of mounting evidence, evidence of Israel's injustice and unfaithfulness. Hear this, Amos declares, you that trample on the needy and bring to ruin the poor of the land, saying, when will the Sabbath be over so that we may sell grain? We will make the measure small and the profit great and practice deceit with false balances, buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and selling even the sweepings of the wheat. The Lord has witnessed and has taken note of the corruption among God's people. And God is putting you and me and everyone in between on notice. 
In effect, God is saying, you speak righteousness with your lips, but you practice injustice with your hands. You worship with with pious rituals, but you participate in and perpetuate unjust systems of trade. And so you will find that the songs you sing in the temple will soon turn to wailings. Similarly, in Luke 10, at the very end of this chapter that we have spent so much time in this month, we find Jesus siding with the sister who sets her work aside rather than the one who busies herself with chores and various responsibilities. Martha pours herself into anything and everything that needs doing while Mary pauses and takes time to give her full attention to Jesus. Mary wants to listen, not just overhear what Jesus has to say. And when Martha complains, Jesus tells Martha, and by extension all of us who like to keep ourselves busy, that Mary has chosen the better part I don't know about you, but boy, I feel better. In truth, however, I think that God, through the words of the prophet Amos and the words of the Son, Christ Jesus, our Lord, is in fact giving us exactly what we need. God is showing us the path to what we really long to find, whether we fully know it or not. The path to what Jesus calls the better part, the path to a higher road, a way forward through all of this craziness. Because we really want the world to be better, right? We want the news to be different, right? We don't just want protection from the craziness, but transformation of the craziness, right? We want to see harm become healing, alienation become belonging, hate become love, doubt become faith, despair become hope, darkness become light, sadness become joy, right? Well, if that's true, then we need more than comfort, And we certainly need more than the distraction of busyness because both of those things keep us narrowly focused on ourselves because comfort is fleeting and busyness is a charade, a way we pretend things are normal when in fact they are anything but. There may be pride to be found in busyness, but not life. Not the life that truly is life. And that's what Jesus really wants for us. Right? Right. He wants us to live and to live abundantly and everlastingly. To find the life that truly is life, we therefore have to learn to see with a broader, more probing lens to honestly face ourselves and earnestly face our God. Which means, in short, that we have to learn to practice repentance. Repentance is really having the courage to take a long, hard look in the mirror and the patience and the commitment to regularly sit at the feet of Jesus So that Christ can continue to mold us fully into his disciples. In the words of the Apostle Paul, so that Jesus can show us a more excellent way. And this is really what we've been working on and building up to for the past three weeks. As we've wrestled with a series of challenging biblical texts, both familiar and unfamiliar. It's not just today that we've been challenged. It's really all month long. We were challenged with the story of Naaman, who discovered that the healing he sought was so much simpler than what he envisioned. 
In fact, he almost missed it because he said, this can't possibly be how God can heal me. It's got to be something grand. It's got to be something complex. It's got to be a great deed of daring do. He almost missed it. Then we read about Jesus sending out the 70 disciples into a dangerous world without so much as a wallet, a bag, or even sandals as cover. And in our first encounter with the prophet Amos, he reminded us that God is going to measure the full height, the full breadth, and the full depth of God's people, their accomplishments, their life together, according to the specs of the kingdom of heaven. Not just certain compartmentalized sections as we would prefer, as if we could put faith over here and the rest of our life over there. God is going to measure the totality of it all. Then in the parable of the Good Samaritan, the danger that the 70 faced is confirmed. There's a man who has fallen victim to robbers on the road between Jerusalem and Jericho and left for dead at the side of the road. But neither the righteous priest nor the esteemed Levite is the hero of this story. The hero turns out to be an uncouth, unclean Samaritan who is willing to put propriety aside and venture into the ditch to care for the victim who is lying there. In the words of Martin Luther King Jr., the Samaritan reversed the conventional question that we tend to ask in those sorts of situations. Instead of asking, what will happen to me? He asked himself, what will happen to him? And acted accordingly. But repentance is really the keystone that holds the arch of this revolutionary narrative that Jesus and the prophets are painting for us together. Because we can't realize God's vision for this kind of brave, new, and better world. A world where justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream to quench our thirst and irrigate our souls and fill the land with all sorts of good things for all of God's people. We can't realize that vision without a change of heart. Because without a change of heart, without repentance, we're going to continue to try to dam up those waters and try to divert them, to keep them for ourselves and use them to serve our purposes. Repentance is so key, in fact, that it is the first instruction that Jesus gives following his baptism in both the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. Repent! For the kingdom of heaven has come near. And in order to repent, there are at least two things that have to happen. First, we have to be willing to hear the challenging things that God has to say to us through the voices of the prophets, both ancient and modern. We have to be willing to face tough truths about why the world is as crazy as it is. And our role in helping it be that way. We have to be willing to let God call us out. And second, we have to be willing to widen our circles, to welcome and be welcomed by new faces and new voices. Because God doesn't just speak to us or through us. We have to become more egalitarian in the ways we live out our faith. Because that's a big part of the vision that God has for the world. We have to practice what we preach. Martha's voice in Luke 10 isn't just the voice of busyness. It's the voice of the establishment. The voice that wants to keep Mary in her quote unquote place. It's the voice that says, Jesus, tell Mary to get back over here, back into the background, back where she belongs, back to doing her woman's work. But Jesus will have none of it. 
he welcomes Mary openly to come and sit in the circle of the disciples to listen because she too is part of the vision, part of this radical, redemptive narrative that he has come to proclaim. And these are strong, challenging, weighty words that God has for us as God's people. There's no getting around it. These are strong words. They are tough to handle. But they're only so weighty because the gospel is a very weighty thing. The gospel is power. The gospel is hope. The gospel is peace. The gospel is life. The gospel is the life that truly is life. The life that God wants for us. Not just for you and me, but for all people all over the world, anywhere and everywhere. God wants life. God wants all people to realize who we have been created to become, to realize that we belong. That we belong to God, we belong to heaven, we belong to earth, and we belong to one another. Which is why these things matter. Which is why God confronts us and asks us to do certain challenging, weighty things if we desire to be his disciples. It's why God calls us out in both senses of that phrase. God calls us out. He exposes our sin, our self-centeredness, our worldliness, and he holds us accountable Because justice is a heavenly concern, and if we are God's people, we are expected to be a heavenly people. We are expected to live with our minds and our bodies set on heavenly things, not earthly things. And justice is a heavenly thing. As Cornel West puts it, justice is what love looks like in public. And so God calls us out. When we are part of these systems of injustice that are making the world a crazy place. But God also calls us out in another sense. He calls us out. He exposes things that we need to see so that he can call us out to be the church, to form us and shape us into the people of Jesus, even the very body of Christ. That's what the Greek word for the church in the New Testament, ekklesia, means. It means the called out ones, the ones who are called out from the crowds to stand and be different, to stand and be on mission, to stand and belong together and bear witness to this radical redemptive narrative of inclusion and redemption. God calls us out. In both senses of that phrase, because that is how we discover life. That is how we grow. That is how we discover our value, how we learn to contribute, how we learn what we're truly capable of, and how we come to belong to heaven, to earth, and to one another, to be part of the body. It's how we discover what God has for us. And it's not as if we're starting at scratch here at Kingsway. We are already learning to lean into this narrative. And so, as I come to my conclusion today, I want to share with you a letter that I received from a volunteer at Kids Camp who wants to remain anonymous but who asked me to find an appropriate place in the service to share this with you. And I think this is the most appropriate place because it really speaks to what can happen when we lean into this radical redemptive narrative of the gospel and allow God to call us out and call us out. This person says, Dear Kingsway, thank you for being such an amazing and supportive community that so openly shares the love of God to our neighbors. 
This week, I had the privilege to work alongside MJ, the summer interns, volunteers, campers, and parents at Kids Camp. God shone richly through this week's adventures, and I felt compelled, compelled to shout out this successful week. To the parents, thank you for sharing your beautiful children with us. It was a pleasure to be in the presence of such beautiful gifts from God. To the campers, your enthusiasm rocked. I loved watching you learn, play, create, and sing all about our wonderful God. You are such incredible gifts from God, and I really appreciated your caring and sharing with your campmates, and especially welcoming our recess campers. You made them and their parents feel so welcome and accepted. What a beautiful gift. Of God's love, an egalitarian expression of God's love. To the volunteers, man, it was hot. And you rocked it in the heat with passion, love, patience, and guidance. I learned so much about God from how you worked with our campers. Thank you. To our incredible interns, Christina, Naomi, Charlotte, the twin, Katie, Izzy, Kaylin, Elysia, Isabel, Matt, Carol, Amy, Carlo, Gabriel, Jira, Jethro, Isaiah, and TJ. Wow. What can I say? You took my breath away with your organizational skills, management skills, your understanding of the kiddos, your love for children, and your love of God. We are truly blessed that you are so willing to share your gifts of God with us. You are an amazing witness of love, compassion, and caring. Now, MJ. I write this with tears in my eyes. Your vision for sharing God with our young adults, youth, campers, parents, and volunteers is breathtaking. You bring out the best in people and build such capacity in all the individuals you walk alongside. You are truly a gifted, intelligent, wise woman of God, and I am honored to be allowed to walk alongside you. This vision is yours, and it empowers everyone in the circle of your presence. I thank you. I thank God for you and your mission of work here at Kingsway. You make heaven happen here on earth. My heartfelt thank you to you. To Kingsway, thank you for supporting this amazing ministry with love and gratitude. A very thankful volunteer parentheses, don't say my name, the focus is camp. Now, you may not think so. You may not realize it. But this letter is chock full of the evidence of repentance. Because... This letter is a testimony to the fact that this past week at kids' camp here at Kingsway Baptist Church, everyone named made conscious decisions, conscious choices to be egalitarian, to organize not just what we talk about around the principles of the kingdom of God, but how we talk about it, how we do it as an expression of the principles of the kingdom that has come near. The kingdom we are called upon to model and proclaim. It's an egalitarian expression. It's an expression that allows space for God to say some challenging things to everyone involved and lift us up higher because so many different people are welcome to be part of the circle. We didn't just have recess kids part of camp. We had folks with different abilities as part of the leadership team here at camp this week. And what an amazing egalitarian expression of the gospel that is. And what an expression of the patience and the intentionality that we have of sitting at the feet of Jesus and letting him teach us 
and mold us and shape us more fully into his disciples. The challenge for us going forward into next week, next month, next year is not to rest on our laurels. The challenge for us is to ask ourselves, how do we take, how do we take the spirit of kids camp beyond kids camp? How do we take that spirit beyond these walls as a way to embrace and involve our community, our city, and indeed the entirety of our world? What prevents us from making everything at, Ki- at Kingsway like kids camp? That is the challenging prophetic question that is before us as a congregation as we move forward. So well done, Kingsway. Well done. Now, let's be willing to sit with the prophets and let them hold that mirror up to us and take a long, hard look. Let us be willing to sit at the feet of Jesus, not just to overhear the gospel, but to listen directly and intently to what Jesus has to say about how we can further grow and embody this radical, redemptive narrative of the gospel in our day and our time. How can we let God continue to call us out so that he can send us out that through our life and our witness, the dams of this world that hold back the rolling waters of justice and the mighty streams of righteousness might break So those waters of living water might come to irrigate and cover not just us, but our entire community, our entire city, and our entire world. Thanks be to God for loving us enough to call us out. Amen.